Good morning, and welcome to Beyond the Headlines on CIUT 89.5 FM. I'm your host, Jordan. Beyond the Headlines is a weekly current affairs show that aims to make public policy discussions more accessible to you. We take you beyond the headlines of our daily news, bringing you access to current leaders through in-depth interviews. You can join us in the conversation by tweeting at Beyond Headlines. That's B-Y-O-N-D underscore headlines. Canada is lucky to border on the Great Lakes, which hold about 20% of the world's fresh water. Today, we're going to be talking about the importance of good policies to manage our water and delve into some of the environmental and policy challenges. Dr. George Aranditsis from the University of Toronto Scarborough will get us up to speed on the major environmental challenges faced by our water sources and how we can address them. And Dr. Gail Kranzberg from McMaster University will then help us dive into the intricacies of policymaking for such a large and shared body of water. Our first guest today is Professor George Aranditsis, who is currently the chair of the Department of Physical and Environmental Sciences at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He is also the editor-in-chief for e Ecological Informatics and associated editor for the journals Aquatic Ecosystem Health and Management and Water. He has been the director of the Ecological Modeling Laboratory at the University of Toronto Scarborough for nearly 15 years. His research philosophy promotes a critical approach to modeling by introducing novel uncertainty analysis techniques to improve our understanding or offer pragmatic solutions to a wide range of environmental problems. Using watershed, aquatic ecosystem, population, and socioeconomic models, his research has been used to assist environmental management and to guide the policymaking process in a wide range of systems worldwide. So, Professor Artendisitz, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to, to talk about water. So I wanted to just kind of jump in with a general overview. So you've done a lot of work in monitoring and modeling for watersheds and water quality. Um, could you give us a brief overview of what Canada's watersheds, particularly in the Great Lakes regions, are facing today? Um, so what are some of the challenges? What are some of the triumphs with managing our water? Yeah, I really like the spirit, the way this question is uh, posed, because uh, there are many things to actually celebrate and cherish based on uh, past record, but there also there are some uh, challenges that we have to deal uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, the, um, uh, for uh, quite some time, a uh, point source pollution associated with wastewater used to be the leading cause of freshwater degradation. But the advent of uh, wastewater treatment plants has been instrumental in mitigating their impact over the past uh, two or three decades. So here we can actually declare a uh, success. At the same time, um, the Canadian waters, it's as, you know, elsewhere, it's not just a Canadian issue. Um, the food production systems, for example, agriculture, that is, uh, urbanization and other anthropogenic activities profoundly shape the availability and will shape the availability and distribution of our uh, precious freshwater resources in the future. Um, an additional challenge, and I, and I believe that we'll have the opportunity to discuss a little bit more, uh, has to do with the climate change and the broader alterations that it brings to the terrestrial hydrological and nutrient cycles. Um, in the Great Lakes, uh, more specifically, um, there was there were significant water uh, quality issues. We had um, uh, across all the Great Lakes, 43 sites which were um, listed as um, areas of uh, concern. Uh, and these were sites that had significant water quality problems, basically the sort of you know, more official uh, jargon, scientific jargon, is that the integrity of physical, chemical and biological processes was impaired. And um, out of these 43 sites um, were, um, uh, that were identified as areas of concern, 12 were Canadian and five were binational. And um, after uh, almost four decades of active efforts to restore them, uh, we are in a very positive uh, position to indicate that we have sites that uh, are fully restored sites that in recovery and um, sites that um, already yeah, they're still listed as impaired uh, but there is significant discernible progress over time in particular as far as, as far as my research program is concerned i had the opportunity and the pleasure to work in some of um, 
uh, areas of concern that are closer in our neighborhood, uh, the Hamilton Harbor, the Toronto uh, Harbor, uh, the Bay of Quinty, and I have also active research in uh, Lake Erie. Hey, that's amazing. Um, it's it's always great to hear that there has been progress made and there is kind of a attention for this issue and something being done about it. Um, but what I say, if I may, this is the thing that uh, sometimes I'm a little bit concerned in the sense that uh, when we're talking about the environment, there is all this pessimistic, negative perspective, and um, which I don't know to what extent it's conducive or at least creative, gives the appropriate drive to deal. Um, I don't want us to overstate the problems. There are real problems, problems that we need to act as soon as possible. But at the same time, we need to cherish and learn from our successes. And there are many successes that we can actually discuss. You mentioned some of the challenges it included agriculture um, and included sites that weren't making as much progress as the others. What kind of what happens if we don't start addressing some of the challenges that you've identified? Um, not necessarily worst case scenario, um, but kind of a little, a little push towards towards better policy making in those areas. Yeah, okay. Let's change a little bit then uh, the um, uh, the tone of my of our discussion and start with the more you know troublesome issues. Yes, the main challenge. Uh, um, uh, after addressing the point source pollution has to do with the fact that non-point source pollution is um, the um, um, potentially the leading cause at this point of all the water quality problems that we have. And what do I mean by non-point source pollution? It is the type of pollution from diffuse sources that sometimes it's very difficult to locate in space where they are. And... Um, in uh, many respects, we do not have yet the appropriate technology and infrastructure to address them. So, uh, although there is recognition of the problem, so it's not like that we do not act yet. No, there is an ongoing, very active research and management in place. And um, they are not always effective or at least effective up to the expectations, the specs. So addressing point source pollution through the wastewater treatment plants, it's something that is more manageable. It, there is less uncert uncertainty. With the diffuse sources of pollution, it's more challenging. And this involves not only the agriculture, but also the urbanization, the urban sprawl that takes place that impacts profoundly the environment and changes significantly the hydrological cycle. And on the top of that, we have a major confounding factor that has to do with the climate change. And um, uh, that uh, definitely um, modifies the way certain problems are being manifested. Actually, recently, two days ago by recently, we completed a study uh, in the Bay of Quinte area, uh, doing some sort of retrospective analysis, what has happened in the area for the past 40 years in terms of the... Um, uh, tributary water, the water quality in the tributaries, and also using uh, mathematical models to project what we will expect the next 80 years. And uh, the trend is that um, um, the with warmer winters, we will have a tendency for that spring freshet when the snow melts to happen earlier than it used to. So sometimes even in February, or in the midst of the winter, we may experience higher flows, stream flows, so greater export of nutrients than it we are used to. <coughs> at, the same, excuse me, at the same time, there are projections um, that um, the flow, um, the export uh, during the summer may be lower because we may have more dry conditions. But at the same time, projection, the projections suggest higher frequency of extreme events, extreme precipitation events, which effectively what they represent is a shock for the system. So within a short time period, a massive influx of nutrients and contaminants entered the system, which has profound implications for the biology. So we need to plan not only ongoing issues, but also and that's the importance of adapting. We need to kind of, in view of these projections, what may be happening, 
which, by the way, some of these projections are being corroborated by empirical evidence, so they're actually happening. We need to adapt our management practices in a way that will consider what may be happening 20 or 30 years down the road. These are some of the most, I suppose, um, the primary challenges that we will face within the context of watershed management. Okay. Thank you so much. So that's a, a really good overview of kind of the, the scientific side of this. So what you've been doing, what you've been monitoring in your research. Um, but I wanted to ask a little bit, how how effective are we at getting that part of the conversation into our policymaking for water management? Is this an easy conversation to have with politicians and with policymakers? Um, or is it a little bit more complicated than that? <laughs> yes, definitely. There are all sorts of uh, different complexities. One thing that it's not worth it, though, is um, that uh, the very basic premise of the management in the Great Lakes uh, is that in each site that was listed as an area of concern, um, there was a remedial action plan in place consisting of uh, all sorts of you know lo local stakeholders not just the scientific community, we're talking about the public, um, the, all the players, the key actors of the socioeconomic activities in, that part, in any particular site. So uh, it was an implicit, an additional layer in that process is public engagement. So each site, each remedial action plan was responsible to educate the public about the ongoing progress. And this is, I suppose, the essence of any effective management plan. You cannot disconnect, disengage the public, ultimately the recipients, those who experience, they're being exposed to all these you know, major environmental pollution problems in all sorts of different facets of their daily lives. It's not just a scientific endeavor. It is something broader, integrated, and should involve everyone, including more than anything else, actually the public. So this is happening, but definitely it's an ongoing process and we need to engage the public more and more. And um, the important thing here is that we need the scientific knowledge, basically what we've been discussing so far, to be communicated in an effective way, in a way that everyone understands. So that's the one part of the issue. And um, I believe it should receive, or I mean, it should be one of our priorities as we move forward. The second issue is the fact that we're talking about the environment, an open system that it's not controlled. It's subject to all sorts of uncertainty associated with factors that cannot be controlled, for example, the weather, but at the same time, uncertainty associated with our knowledge, the fact that as we move forward, our understanding of the dynamics of an ecosystem is improving, but we still know that there are many uncertainties and unknown factors. That's actually the essence, the drive of science. But at the same time, decisions have to be made today. So the uncertainty, the risk that we may do something but may not be 100% successful, should be factored in the policymaking process. And that's where the challenge is, because the um, uh, policymakers, politicians, they prefer to work on a binary mode, yes or no, black or white, and they expect something today, if possible, the result. It doesn't work that way. I understand their drive. I understand the challenges that they are faced, that they want to show within uh, the foreseeable future that we have success or at least measures are being taken and so on. But the reality in, when you are dealing with the environment is that we have this uncertainty. You do not know, even if you implement certain management measures, you do not know to what extent it will be 100% successful. And most importantly, you cannot determine the timing. Is it going to be tomorrow? five years down the road, and so on. And I will have an example for you shortly. And um, uh, this, I suppose, I don't know to what extent disparity is the appropriate term, different mindset, I suppose, the reality when you are dealing with an open environmental system and the needs of the policy-making process is always a challenge, and it will continue to be.
Okay, I just okay. told you that um, uh, we are making projections. What will happen 20, 30, 40 years down the road? These projections clearly have significant uncertainty based on the knowledge that we possess now. So this needs to be factored in. We do not have um, the capacity to provide this deterministic yes or no, black or white type of statements that they expect, the politicians expect. Okay. Um, the, ah, I'm go just going to tell you an example for the, um, uh, from the Hamilton Harbor, a distant experience from the, uh, from the area where um, we, you know, we have, um, there is a major investment from the local community to upgrade all the wastewater in the plants to reduce the loading, the nutrients and the contaminants that are being imported, discharged into the system. Significant investment. And with the support, basically, of the federal, provincial government, and so on. So it is a very positive, I suppose, situation where we have a consensus about the next step. But even with that, uh, we have, for example, because that's how the environment works, you have in the sediments of that system the legacy nutrients, the legacy contaminants, which may become, at this point, may not be the most significant factor that shapes the dynamics of the system. But we do expect that it will take five or 10 years even to kind of um, their impact to dissipate and ultimately the system to reach a steady state. So this is something that cannot be controlled. It is the way nature reacts, responds. You cannot control that. So although the investments were made, there is an agreement, a consensus in the local community about what needs to be done. So everything seems to be in place. The ultimate result may take a while to be achieved. And it may not be fully exactly what we expect. There will be water quality improvement, but not what the local community aspires for. So these are the challenges between action and uh, policy. Okay, that's fantastic. And I, I love the local example as well. Uh, we're a Toronto-based radio station, so Hamilton Harbor is great. Um, and I just wanted to, to expand the conversation a little bit. Um, so you've studied water across the world. Um, and I was wondering how you think Canada compares internationally when it comes to water management and data collection for just water monitoring as well. Um. I am uh, actually very pleased with um, the um, uh, conditions and the mindset that the Canadian government operates. I know that we have the tendency to complain. <laughs> it's part of the human nature. But I want to really communicate a positive message in the sense that we're fa we fare very well relative even to our neighbors in the South. Um, is there a space for improvement? Absolutely. No question. Definitely, there are locations and we would definitely need um, additional resources to monitoring to monitor more frequently um, uh, certain water bodies, our watersheds, rivers, creeks, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, um, to be fair, even the scientific community needs to be a little bit because it's not just give us more money to monitor more frequently, do more monitoring. Uh, we need to be a little bit smarter in the way we're using the resources because they are finite resources. So we have to accept that. And there are, there is science uh, associated with this uh, exercise to basically identify the areas, the locations, the times of the year where we increase the value of information that we collect from the monitoring progress, how we maximize the benefits out of a certain monitoring program. So with the same resources, you can learn more by following a different sampling design relative to a different one. So we need to become a little bit more efficient and use science that is already in place to maximize the value of information. With that being said, we cannot take this progress, our status now, our status um, uh, in the world for granted, because there are many, many countries, especially from the developing world, that are making significant progress 
because they are being faced with serious environmental problems. I had the pleasure to work extensively in China. And uh, I must say that they have developed a national program within less than 10 years that it's really impressive the way they monitor their uh, water uh, courses altogether. And um, as a whole, that's very positive, I suppose. But um, uh, we need to be always aware about you know what's happening in Europe, in China, as I said, India, and other countries, because they are making some significant progress, as we see, as we you know, as we talk. And uh, yeah, there are some interesting lessons to be learned. There. Okay, that's very cool. Um, and again, I love the positive note. Um, so I'm just gonna start to wrap us up because we're almost out of time. Um, but our final question today is. So Beyond the Headlines is designed to give people an overview of a topic that they might not know a lot about, just kind of as a jumping off point to, to start and to learn more. Um, we're also kind of hoping that this episode might inspire some action. Uh, so can you recommend a good way for people to get engaged in water management in their own lives, just daily lives, day-to-day -day stuff that they can do um, to be more aware or as just a kind of a learning point as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, don't take water for granted. Be careful about your water consumption. Um, to me, and I know that it will sound a little bit unorthodox as a recommendation, but um, I truly, truly encourage everyone to embrace the environment and more, you know, uh, to connect better with nature in their daily lives. Because when that condition is met, then it impacts your whole and your entire outlook about you see the environment. So if people um, invest a little bit more time during their weekends, whenever they have free time, to go in the waterfront, to kind of see the beauty of our lakes, of, you know, in or in nature in general, this immediately kind of changes your outlook. And there are many opportunities then to, to get involved with all sorts of different programs that uh, can, you know, eco-friendly programs that can actually um, promote and uh, help, uh, assist the environment. I can, uh, for example, what I can tell you is that public um, science, citizen science, and um, involvement with the data collection is one of the emerging topics in environmental science altogether. And I have uh, one PhD student who's working exclusively with that, how we can capitalize upon data that are being uh, uh, obtained by the involvement of the public science data, citizen science data. A, a couple of points before I forget, a, another area that we need to focus on and it's a challenge in the environment that will be actually very helpful is that we do not have solid estimates um, and there is a lot of work to be done in um, translating the benefits from the environment in economic and monetary terms. And I find it many times when there is, and it sort of relates with our discussion with the policy, that um, when the policymakers are uh, reluctant or they sometimes they resist about certain decisions to be made related to management, when you present the actual benefits in monetary terms that we gain from the environment, what you are getting in return, just to kind of see how much it is worth to invest in protecting them, then this facilitates significantly the policy making process. This is something that we are lacking. There is a lot of space for improvement and advancement of our knowledge based on what we have now. And frankly, uh, if you dissect the ecosystem services, what we're gaining, what we're gaining from environmental systems, both directly through you know fish, water, drinking water, and so on, but even indirectly the aesthetic, the what it has in our psychology, our mindset by interacting with the environment, the benefits, you will be surprised what is the actual value. Professor, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much. Once again, that was Professor George Arandesis. Thanks so much for joining us. For those who have just tuned in, you're listening to Beyond the Headlines. We're a weekly public affairs talk show that airs every Monday at 11 a.m. on CIUT 89.5 in Toronto, online through our website and across podcast platforms such as Apple Podcasts and Spotify. This week, we're talking about policymaking and the importance of water management. Have you enjoyed the conversation so far and want to add your voice? 
please send us a tweet at Beyond the Headlines. If you have suggestions or feedback for our show, take a moment to complete our survey at www.beyondtheheadlines.net slash feedback. We are listening. Our next guest today is Dr. Gail Kranzberg, who is a professor and program lead for the Master's in Engineering and Public Policy program in the Walter G. Booth School of Engineering Practice and Technology at McMaster University. Gail completed her MSc and PhD at the University of Toronto in Environmental Science and Freshwaters. She worked for the Ontario Ministry of Environment from 1988 to 2001 as coordinator of Great Lakes programs and senior policy advisor on Great Lakes. In her tenure there, she was intensely engaged in the binational Great Lakes science and policy venue, president of the International Association of Great Lakes Research, board member of numerous water-related nonprofits, member of the International Joint Commission's Water Quality Board, Sediment Priority Action Committee, Indicators Implementation Task Force, and is currently Canadian co-chair of the IJC's Science Advisory Board Science Priority Committee. Dr. Kranzberg was the director of the Great Lakes Regional Office of the Joint Commission from 2001 to 2005. In 2007, she was appointed as an adjunct faculty member of the United Nations University Institute for Water and Environmental Health and participated in the twinning of the Laurentian and African Great Lakes. So thanks again so much for joining us. Um, I guess we'll we'll dive right in. Um, we want to talk to you a little bit about um, your science background, but also your policy background on water management. Um, so could you comment on the importance and the difficulties of ensuring that science informs this type of environmental policy making when it comes to Canada's watersheds? Sure. Um, one of the biggest problems is that scientists don't understand policy making and they don't know how to speak to policymakers. And policymakers don't understand science. And so when a scientist gives a policymaker an answer, the policymaker thinks it's completely off track. And so the scientists may think the question's off track. So there's a whole training piece involved here where scientists have to understand that policymakers make decisions not just based on science but based on equity, based on economics, based on political views. There's a whole range of things that influence public policy based on public perception, public pressure. And so often policy responds to the public's desire for some sort of action and a policymaker will just put something forward and it won't necessarily be based on science. So one of the consequences then is that you get policies and if they're not science-based, they may work, but then they may be totally flawed because they're missing some component of science that invalidates the way the policy is supposed to work. So let me elaborate. Um, we had a cryptosporidium outbreak in Walkerton quite a number of years ago where many, a few people died. Many people had permanent liver damage because they had diarrhea. And when you have diarrhea, you drink, but cryptosporidium was in the groundwater. So to respond to that, the government put in place a, ground, a source water protection act where wells, and the reason cryptosporidium was in the well water was partly because the wells were fairly close to cattle farms, but also because it wasn't being treated properly by the technicians who should have been purifying the water. But the pro province's response was thou shall not sit a site, a well for groundwater drinking water for a certain distance away from a farm that has cattle. But what that forgets is that soil can be sandy, it could be loamy, it could be clay, and water flows differently in, at different speeds and for different lengths of, of, of distance, depending on the soils. So by just putting in a blanket statement that says, our policy is this distance from a farm, they blew it because some of the distances were so far, they were not even necessary and others were too close because of the nature of the soils. So there's an example where policy didn't consider the science of hydrogeology and, and wasn't as effective as it could have been. So to bring up a, a more recent example um, of Bill 23 that Ford just passed, um, would you take this as an indication that Canada or Ontario in general hasn't really been moving in the right direction to incorporate more science-based policies? So let's keep Canada and Ontario separate because the province has certain responsibilities that are very different from the federal government. Ontario, under this administration, um, favors economic growth over everything else. And so policies to protect water quality 
are not on the top of the agenda. So if we want to in if we want economic growth, we want to develop housing on green space. So Bill 23 is a huge detractant into the green belt's um, integrity. It allows developers who were never allowed once built once once the green belt was formed to actually construct housing on the green belt for purposes purportedly of making more houses for the homeless. But many economics economic many land use planners, maybe economists will tell you there's plenty of space in our urban corridors to build up and intensify without destroying the green belt because the green belt, aside from being a food production place for Ontario, is a sponge for water that goes down into the ground, into Lake Ontario, which is where we get our drinking water. So now if we pave over parts of the green belt, we lose that ability to capture the water and therefore the water flows over the surfaces and under severe storm events, you get massive flooding. And massive flooding means raw sewage backing up in people's basements. It means sewers overflowing raw sewage, human excrement into our lakes where we get our drinking water. So this administration doesn't get that environmental protection by the way of protecting the green belt helps save lives. It helps reduce health costs. It does a lot of things, but the priorities here is grow, grow, grow at any cost. So right now, Ontario isn't getting water policy right. It has in the past, but under this administration, it's pedaling backwards. It take, it's taken away the rigor with which we protect our wetlands. And the wetlands are the biological engines of our lakes. That's where the fish grow, reproduce, amphibians and so on grow and reproduce. That's where water's purified in the near shore. But the new way that we're going to now evaluate wetlands is piece by piece by piece. Now think about if you have two small pieces of wetland, but they're connected, it effectively is a larger piece of wetland. But if you're allowed to just look at one and then at the other, each one of its own doesn't seem very important, so we can fill them in. And that's policy that is not based on science and that is hugely detrimental to the health of the waters and the health of the people who rely on the waters. So Bill 23 is a travesty. It's been passed, but organizations like the Canadian Environmental Law Association, for example, or Environmental Defense, continue to push to have it repealed, to have it amended. And anybody listening to this who's annoyed that our green space is being destroyed or, and will be destroyed, needs to get politically active and talk to their parliamentarians and talk to their members of provincial parliament, talk to their councillors, talk to the mayor, and make sure that cities and towns and villages push back on the Ford administration and says, no, we're not gonna build there. We're gonna build in our location without destroying green space. So that's fantastic. You you mentioned a lot of actors there. Do you think, or do you have an opinion on which actors might be the most important for this kind of policy making? Does it take place mostly, does most of that change, can it take place at a municipal level or does it have to go up to the provincial level? A lot of it can happen at the municipal level. That's where this is. Now it's difficult because municipalities were created by the province of Ontario, but mayors are powerful and they have the ears of their members of parliament, members of provincial parliament. So with mayors talking to members of provincial parliament in their writings to lobby against this, that's a powerful instrument. It's not enough. That's why I mentioned some of those non-government organizations that rally other sectors of society, the business sector, maybe the building sector. Why not to say, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to destroy our, our, the future for future generations. We want to do it right. So I mentioned a lot of actors because one single way into government is not enough. You need to go in many different directions, but definitely mayors and cities pushing back on the province is an important indicator to the province that maybe they've made a mistake in judgment. This might be a, a little bit of a hopeful question, but do you think there is a chance for, or do you think there is a way to get people to put politics aside and just focus on shared governance issues that affect all of our lives, um, but based on that kind of that science-based policy? It's, it's interesting that you ask that. And I'm going to go now to a different level of government. I'm going to talk about Canada, but I'm also going to talk about Canada and the United States. 
because we live here, we're privileged to live on the largest reservoir of fresh water on the planet in our Great Lakes. And regardless of who's in power, the prime minister's office or the president's office, at a bureaucratic level, the shared governance of those waters is a passion of the people who work for government, regardless of the party in power, regardless of the politics. So there are ways to put party politics aside to a very large degree if you're focused on the shared purpose of restoring and enhancing the waters of the Great Lakes region. So I know that when I worked for a transnational organization called the International Joint Commission, the heads, the commissioners are appointed by the prime minister in the president's office. And if you have a Republican president and a liberal prime minister, they're not gonna see politics the same way, but they're swearing an oath to not represent their governments, but to present the shared transnational waters. So if we can get that to work, it's a, it's a very positive step forward. So I do think if we understand shared governance and sometimes shared governance is shared between Canada and the province, and that may be different political parties. But if we understand the value of clean water to society, politics can be toned down for the shared governance attributes and the benefits to the people and to the economy and the environment of the region. So I'm actually really glad you brought up the Canada-US relation and our, our shared bodies of water there, because um, I wanted to ask a little bit about that. Obviously, we have a treaty in place that was put in place in the 70s to protect our Great Lakes. Um, but what does the Canada-US relationship get right about kind of transnational water management that might be or that could be extrapolated a little bit to other areas of the world as well? Because a lot of rivers, a lot of lakes share borders with multiple countries. So let me backtrack a little. The only treaty was signed in 1909, over 100 years ago. That was the Boundary Waters Treaty that said, amongst other things, thou shall not do something on your side of the border that causes injury to humans, property, or the environment on the other side of the border. 100 years ago, it was a treaty. It was about sharing water equitably, but it was also about not causing injury to the other side. In 72, the governments of Canada and the United States signed the Great Lakes Water Quality, an agreement. It's not a treaty, it's an agreement. It's almost like a gentleman's agreement. It's not law, it's sort of soft law. And since then, they've been working collaboratively to say, what are the biggest threats? And it started off with phosphorus, which was coming from detergents. And when you put too much phosphorus as a nutrient into the waters, you get a massive amount of algae that grows, that green stuff in the water, algae. And when the algae naturally die, they decompose. And when they decompose, they rob the waters of oxygen, which means the fish can't live there and they die. So in the 60s, Lake Erie had massive fish kills. And the government said to the treaty organization, the International Joint Commission, what's going on? They said, after a number of big experiments by the late David Schindler at the Experimental Lakes area, they said it's phosphorus. And we all hear about phosphate-free detergents. That was created because in 1972, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was signed. Phosphate free detergents was a massive policy all over the country because of the Great Lakes. And since then, the government say, okay, what else is going on? They asked the scientists. The International Joint Commission has a science advisory board that says, what are the emerging threats to the Great Lakes? Well, chemicals, pollution, plastics, destruction of habitat, climate change, invasive species, a bunch of science goes into that agreement, which is updated every so often, most recently in 2012, to say, okay, what are we gonna do now about invasive species? We didn't know about them in 72. We know about them now. What are we gonna do in cli about climate change and severe flooding in the Great Lakes and raw sewage, like I said before, um, or drought dro or dropping lake levels because the lakes evaporate in warm winter because there's no ice cover. What are we gonna do about those things? So that shared um, understanding of what's going on, yet using each nation's own legislative tools or regulatory tools, the tools are different in the two countries, it doesn't matter. The shared purpose is there. Each country goes off and does what it can because Ontario has responsibilities that states in the US don't. The United States Environmental Protection Agency has authorities that the federal government in Canada doesn't but it doesn't matter because the shared purpose is there. So this notion of transnational management 
not only is it um, working here quite well in the Great Lakes, but there are transnational water bodies, hundreds of them all over the world. And about 10 years ago, some of us from North American Great Lakes were invited by example to go to Lake Victoria in East Africa because there's three countries in, in East Africa that share that lake. And that lake is sustenance for those people. Those people get their food directly from the lake. And the lake was having nutrient enrichment problems, climate change problems. And they said, how are you doing it in the Great Lakes? What can we learn from you? And we said, how are you doing in Lake Victoria? What can we learn from you? And so that notion of sharing different approaches towards transnational governance, transnational management, many different places can learn from each other. The Baltic Sea is another one in Europe, you know, where, where many European countries are coming together, aside from politics, to protect the Baltic. So it's absolutely um, inspiring to see that, you know, after 35, 40 years of work collaboratively on the Great Lakes, that other parts of the world are looking to us and that we're looking to other parts to do better. So it is transferable. As long, and even though I said Lake Victoria, which is geopolitically very, very different, when the geopolitics, when the geography and the politics are kind of similar, then transferability is even easier. I want to Take my turn to backtrack a little bit, um, just to clarify on how the agreement can kind of affect um, Ontario's policy. So obviously it's an agreement at the federal level between the US and Canada, um, but what kind of effect does this have on, on policies like Bill 23 or other examples um, to kind of rein in and kind of reinforce that science-based policy and uh, science-based caretaking? It's a, it's a wonderful question because before Canada could even contemplate signing the 1972 agreement, they had to come to an agreement with Ontario to participate because a lot of the roles and responsibility are provincial jurisdiction and Canada could not force things that the province wouldn't be on board with. So way back in 1971, there was a Canada-Ontario agreement respecting the Great Lakes Basin. And that one's been renewed at, at least eight, nine, ten times now, as, as every five to seven years, ten years, it just, just depends. So every period, every five to seven years, Canada and Ontario sit down and negotiate the next Canada-Ontario agreement. Canada will do these things, Ontario agrees to do those things, and then collaboratively they see how that can contribute to delivering the promises under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. The hard part is Canada cannot stop Ontario from passing a bill like Bill 23. That is in Ontario's jurisdiction. They can use political persuasion. They can try and write language into the Canada-Ontario agreement that discourages that, but then Ontario may not sign the agreement because they want the liberty to do what they want to do. So there are limitations. The Canada-Ontario agreement, though, is a really powerful tool that enables Canada to negotiate with Ontario what it's going to do to help restore the Great Lakes and protect the Great Lakes. It's not foolproof, but it's a very useful piece of soft law. Again, it's an agreement they, you know, if you, if you fail to meet your, your promise under the agreement, nobody's taking anybody to court, but there's an embarrassment factor because you've got to report out to the public at the end of the agreement, what you said you would do and what you actually did do. So there's the accountability piece there as well. That's really important. So zooming out a little bit, um, I just want to ask, because we've talked about the, the provincial level and the national level, and I want to bring it out to maybe the global level of just, you've mentioned things like phosphorus um, and detergents that can be controlled by policies um, in Canada and in Ontario. Um, but in terms of just climate change in general um, and fluctuating temperatures, the effects that they can have on ecosystems and all sorts of things, um, how, how can we address kind of those broader issues of climate change or are we bringing those into the, the agreements and how we approach protection of water? Or does that just have to be such a, a much, much larger discussion with things like the Paris Agreement and other international forums? Well, there's two elements to climate change. There's reducing greenhouse gases to mitigate climate change to get to the 1.5 degrees that everybody says will save humanity. I mean, planet will survive, but it's about humanity. And then there's adaptation. The climate has changed. Even if we shut down all emissions now, the climate will continue to change, will continue to get severe uh, events. 
uh, severe fires, severe water, flooding, severe droughts. The extreme events of climate change are here. So there's a whole element of how do we adapt to it so we are a bit more resilient to it. So the under, interestingly, in the Great Lakes region, there's a part in that agreement, uh, working piece, it's called an annex on climate change, that talks about understanding the science better and helping others, helping each other do things like get more resilient to flooding that might mean moving people outside of the floodplain. It might be more, uh, instead of paving over surfaces where you have parking lots or let's say um, rooftops, making the rooftops green to absorb the water, allowing the water to go down into, into the pavement on a parking lot um, and percolate down into the water. There's all sorts of different things that can be done to mitigate flooding, maybe growing different crops that can resist drought. So a lot of the science behind adapting to a climate change, to a changing climate is happening pan-Canada uh, with the help of the federal government, with the help of the provinces. On the issue of reducing greenhouse gases, it's a whole other matter. Because what I just talked about is engineering based on what's going on now. And engineers are smart. I'm not an engineer, I'm a scientist, but nevertheless, engineers are smart, they can fix things. But the hard part is getting off the carbon economy, getting off of fossil fuels. And there's been word and words and words, Paris came and went, Montreal came, um, uh, Egypt came and went, Words and words and words and words, and our, our greenhouse gas emissions keep growing and growing and growing. So there's not, in my, I'm afraid I'm a bit negative on the UN talks, on the COP, you know, conference of the parties, the COP talks, because they're talks. Because the actual hard work is moving to renewables. It's investing in new technology. Electric vehicles are not the solution to the future. No, you know, getting out of a personal vehicle is the solution to the future. Walkable cities is the future, not EVs, because it takes a lot of carbon to build one of those things, regardless of what they emit. But the whole question of moving off of burning coal, wood, burning down forests so we can grow crops in parts of the world, it's a hugely massive and complicated thing. When we see other international accords that were successful, it's because there was an easy alternative, right? So we had carbon fluorocarbon, CFCs in, in aerosols that we discovered were causing a hole in the ozone layer, ozone layer, and that could cause UV light to penetrate the, the planet in a hugely dangerous ways. We banned that easily because chemical engineers figured out there was a more safe alternative to it. So the United States came to the table. They knew there was money in, involved. You know, we can, we can build a whole new industry here, replace all the CFCs across the world, and it's solved. They don't solve carbon emissions that easily. So for water quality, it's about adapting to the changing climate, doing our best to reduce greenhouse gases, but those promises keep getting broken. The climate will continue to change. How do we live with it? And I'll add to that, Jordan, that there are parts of the planet that are uninhabitable. There will be island states that are underwater as sea, uh, as sea, rock, sea levels rise um, when, you know, as the glaciers melt. There will be places that are so arid, there's nowhere to go for water, like sub-Saharan Africa. Where are those people going to go? They need a place to live. They're going to migrate to the Great Lakes region because we have a lot of water. Are we ready for 100 million more people to come here? How are we planning our land use? Are we going to fill up the green belt full of people? No, we're not. So that's about forward-looking policy. And I'll say something about forward-looking policy. It's hard because politicians respond to a crisis. And here, when I talk about forward-looking policies, it's to avoid a crisis. And I had one of my bosses back when I used to work for the province of Ontario saying, Gail, you're trying to advance a Great Lakes policy, nobody's gonna pay attention to somebody dies from bad water. And what happened the next year? Cryptosporidium killed people because of bad water. And what happened right after that? We got a policy. So it's just empirical evidence. The scientist in me tells me, unless there's a crisis, policymakers don't respond. And scientists try and prevent crises and policymakers react to crises. So there's a time lag involved there as well. And the best way of resolving that really is fundamentally forcing the two types of thought 
leaders into rooms together regularly. Get the scientists to talk with the politicians. What are the politicians wanting? What does the science want? Train politicians in what science can and cannot do. Train scientists in what politicians can and or won't do and find some common ground for dialogue. Because until that's done, integrating science-based policy will continue to be a struggle, a necessary struggle. I'm never gonna stop trying, but it's gonna continue to be a struggle. Well, we definitely appreciate you being part of this dialogue as well. Um, but I just want to, to start to wrap up. Um, but Beyond the Headlines is sort of designed to give people an overview and a background on a topic they might not know very much about. Um, we're kind of hoping that this episode might inspire some action as well. So I was wondering, just as a kind of final question to wrap up, um, could you recommend a good way for, for people to get engaged or just to learn more about water management in, in their own lives, in their day-to-day -day lives? First, I asked the question, where does your water come from? And people said, the tap. Thank you. How does the water get to your tap? From the city. Thank you. Where does the city get their water? No idea. So first of all, find out where does your water come from? You'll probably find out if you're living in Toronto, it comes from Lake Ontario. Okay, so what happens when you flush your toilet? Where does the water go? Uh, down the sewer. Okay, good. And from the sewer, where does it go? Uh, not sure. Find that out. It goes to a sewage treatment plant. Can the sewage treatment plant clean up everything you pour down your, 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 your sink? Uh, I don't know. Find out. The answer is no. So if you put a toxic cleaner down your sink, it goes out into the lake where you get your drinking water. Don't you think you should pay attention to that? Now you go to the grocery store, you buy three bananas, and you put them in a plastic bag. Um, they're already, why are you doing that? And then you throw your plastic bag in the blue, blue bin. And that goes into landfill, by the way, only 80% 80 of your blue bin goes into landfill because it's contaminated. And then that blows around and it flies around and it goes into the lake and then you get it breaking down into tiny little plastic pieces that fish eat, they think it's food and the fish starve from plastic pollution that you use the plastic bag for. Ask yourself, why am I doing these things? Because I'm connected to that water and what I do in my household will go down into that lake one way or another and that's where I get my drinking water. That's where I want to swim. That's where the fish live that I maybe I want to eat. And what are you polluting them with? You're choosing to do that. So inform yourself about small changes, small changes. I'm not trying to say you're going to save the world. Do something small in your household. Like, I know we're going to be banning single use plastic, like straws and things like that. But think about refusing things like I'm going to go into a grocery store. I did this a while ago, and there was a package of five cobs of corn on a styrofoam platter with plastic on top of it. And I went to the merchant and I said, can you get me five corn from the back so I don't have to take your garbage with me? Oh, sure. So just ask. Ask for alternatives. Look for alternatives. Look at the labels. Look at what you're pouring down your sink. Figure out how you can clean your apartment, clean your house, clean your residence with really safe things like baking soda and vinegar. They're cheap. They're benign. For goodness sakes, don't use chlorine. Why not? Why shouldn't I use chlorine? Well, read about it. Look at it up on the internet. When you put chlorine with organic matter like food, you create some of the most toxic substances ever known to man. And that gets in your drinking water. Why would you wanna do that? You don't wanna do that. So learn about simple things you can do to pick products carefully, not waste because waste, everything's connected. Can you get out of your car? Can you take transit? Can you walk? Can you bike to school? Because that reduces greenhouse gases, that reduces pollution that lands on the ground, like from your car and washes off into your drinking water, which is the river or your lake. So think about what you do, each individual does. It's no longer the big bad industry who's the problem here. It's individual collective choice that is the big bad problem here. And that's the hardest problem to solve unless we change behavior. So. Think about small changes in your behavior. Dr. Kressberg, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.
You've been listening to Beyond the Headlines on CIUT 89.5 FM. That wraps up our show for this week. We were joined today by Dr. George Aranditsis and Dr. Gail Kranzberg. Many thanks to them for coming onto the show to discuss policy making for water management and some of the current challenges that are faced in this area. Today's show was produced by myself, Jordan Egan, alongside my co-producers, Roberto Fushardi and Antoine fougere ramsamouche If you liked today's episode, please like and review us wherever you're listening. The views expressed on the show do not necessarily reflect the views of the producers, CIUT, or the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. If you missed any part of the show, be sure to check out podcasts of all of our episodes on our website at www.beyondtheheadlines.net, as well as on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're a fan of our show or want to stay up to date with policy issues in Canada, follow us on Twitter at Beyond the Headlines. You can also check us out on Facebook or Instagram. Be sure to tune in next week as we continue to take public policy discussions out of the hallways and onto the airwaves.